Hey Rebels, my name is Matthew Barton. Welcome to the Rebellion Brewing Podcast. There are two reasons most people in Saskatchewan talk about Manitoba. The first thing they want to talk about is the football rivalry between the Riders and the Bombers. The second thing they want to talk about is the craft beer scene. Today, I'm sitting down with Adam Olson from Torque Brewing to talk all about their beer and the Winnipeg beer scene. So let's get into it. Adam, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to come in and talk about some beer. I know we before we hit record, we were just saying we haven't seen each other in like three years. I miss you guys. Yeah, uh, hopefully soon. I, some travel going to be allowed soon, so we're uh, looking forward to getting back to some sort of new normal. That's right. I know Mark came out and saw you guys a week ago? Yeah, I think it was last weekend. That's great. He said he had a great time. He said it was just a great experience all around. Awesome. It's always great to see him. For the sake of my audience who may not know who you are, who are you and what do you do at Torque? Okay, so there's two Adams, before beer and after beer. So the before beer Adam, I was a microbiologist, a government microbiologist. I worked at the uh, public health labs in Winnipeg. Um, I did a master's in microbiology at the University of Alberta, so I have all three Prairie provinces covered. <laughs> I did my undergrad at the University of Winnipeg, and I was born in Regina. So then we have the beer me, which uh, I started home brewing at some point during my just after grad school days, and uh, my hobby became a hob session, became a owner of a brewery. So now I'm the sort of jack of all trades, master of none at Torque. I do a lot of the paperwork that's involved in running a brewery that nobody wants to do or realizes you need to do when you start a brewery. And uh, I was originally part of the, a lot of my homebrew recipes are the initial beers. So our first core beers were all uh, my homebrew beers. So I, I sort of insert myself all through the company at all different levels. The only thing I definitely don't do is sales and marketing that I, I leave to folks who are much better than I am. <laughs> From a, a big picture perspective, what is Torque all about? What can people expect when they walk into your, your brewery? Yeah, so we we pride ourselves, obviously, in having great craft beer. Um, our, our motto is that we sell fun in a glass. So, I mean, it's all about craft beer and having fun. Um, our tap room is a little, um, I mean, Torque sort of gives you that garagey name. We, we came up with Torque because we had a bunch of, home brewers that were also mechanics or engineers or along those lines. So we wanted to stick with that sort of uh, garagey type theme. So our tap room is a little bit, little bit uh, minimalistic with a bit of a garagey like feel to it. Some uh, nice wood, hardwood elm tables that we uh, had made right here in Manitoba. They're their main attraction in our tap room. Uh, they're sort of community seating, which of course has not been great over the last couple of years of COVID, but uh, as we move forward now, we're hoping to have people able to come back and enjoy those those tables. And then we're just about uh, having fun, but also having a mind towards our community. So we're very inserted into our community. Uh, there's no point in having a community if you're not going to help out. You're not really a part of the community if you're not, you know, within it. And especially since in beer, one of the biggest slogans is support local. So we love that people support us. So we also want to support all the businesses, as many as we can. Obviously, there's certain limitations to some things for us that we can't get in, et cetera. But as much as we can, we support local businesses. Uh, we have farmers that grow fruit that we use in our beers. We uh, support the other local businesses either by having their products here or having markets with them in our in our area. We, we just basically, we feel like community is the most important thing and we try to, we strive to be a part of that community and uplift everybody that's in it. In that part there, there was a moment where you said you started off uh, with the recipes that you had designed. So I'm assuming that's like the Hellas and 
the red and the stout. Yeah, so, so our What the Hell is our uh, Redline IPA, our Witty Belgian, and our uh, Diesel Fitter, which was the original core, which has been relegated to a seasonal now since selling stouts on the uh, in Manitoba is still a challenge. <laughs> it's a challenge everywhere. We, uh, yeah. we took our oatmeal stout down to a seasonal as well. I'm the only one, it feels like, who drinks it. <laughs> Yeah, we we have we have serious fans of Diesel Fitter. Like we have people, we have one one client that comes in is we've dubbed him Diesel Dan. He comes in and that's all he buys. It's all he drinks when he's in the tap room. When we dropped it to a seasonal, we were worried of what was going to happen to Diesel Dan. But he's been able to find a few other beers that he likes when he comes in. But but yeah, like it it has a cult following among some, and then just you know. People see dark beer and they're like, "Oh, that's that's not for me." So we keep trying to expand people's uh, horizons, and we replaced it with a mild, which is a dark beer, uh, but obviously not as intimidating. So we we get a lot of people to try that beer, and they when they first see it, they look at, "Oh, that's dark. That's not for me." And then they take a sip, and they're like, "You see their brains working. They're like, wait a minute, this isn't what a dark beer tastes like." And then yeah, we go from there. So hopefully, we'll keep nudging people towards, you know, the darker end of the spectrum. <laughs> it's it's an uphill battle. I've I've long lamented the lack of interest in dark beer because the the two primary examples of it are just so terrible. And if that was your only taste of a dark beer, of course you're not going to like it. I'm like <laughs> it's time for some oatmeal stout. It's time for some really good dark beer, some really good yeah. nice porters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we're we're coming up on our fifth anniversary so we're we're releasing a couple more small batch dark beers but we're hoping that people really like them and get into them what are your big sellers right now so we came up with about two years ago a blonde ale it's sort of become our go-to beer for people hockey games uh golf when they're playing golf all the sports type beers uh they seem to really gravitate towards that one. A lot of people say it's our beer that tastes like beer, sort of like your guys' new campaign. Uh, I wish we had come up with that name. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's 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 become the big seller. Uh, Redline is still a very strong seller for us, so I'm I'm happy about that one. Uh, surprisingly, Hellas doesn't sell as well as we thought it would. Uh, we originally projected that to be our big seller, but. It's still, it's it's a little too out there for the lager drinkers, and it's not quite there for the ale drinkers. So, you know, you just sort of work in. We, we still love that beer. I, I really like it. It's We've had a lot of compliments on that one about it being as close to an ger actual German Hellas as you can get. We've had lots of people here that have come from Germany and say, oh, yeah, that, that tastes like a Hellas. So we're, we're proud of those kind of things, and we just keep working with uh, what's in the scene. I feel that too, man. We've had some beers where they're just stuck in a no man's land. They're they're not crazy enough for the beer geeks who just want like boom bop pow IPA, you know, and and then you have your your very uh clean drinking lager people and that's all they want. And they're never gonna they're never gonna want any kind of flavor or anything big. Yeah. They don't want actual flavors in there. They just want, you know, cold liquid. We've said to people uh, for our blast off, they're like, well, this is a Pilsner. We're like, yeah, this is a Pilsner, a classic a, a, a old school style Pilsner. And they're like, no, this doesn't taste like a Pilsner. I'm like, you're used to drinking this corn thing, corn syrup yeah. Pilsner. And they're, they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, come taste something real, this real food, real drink. And it yeah. just uh, it sketches them out. It, it blows your mind. It really does. And and to think that was the actual Pilsner, right? People people have no idea. Everybody who thinks of Pilsner thinks of, you know, the blue can or the red can. And that's just not really a Pilsner. <laughs> <laughs> what was the first craft beer that opened your eyes to beer? I know we all started our journey with light lagers for most of us. Like if, if you're older than five years ago for drinking i mean you started probably off with a very basic light lager how did you get into it so surprisingly while well, we had fort gary brewing here in the 90s so i was in undergrad university in the mid to late 90s i'm now dating myself but um 
and they had Fort Gary Dark, and that was my first first craft beer. Um, and again, it's it's basically a mild, so it's not like it's super strong flavors or anything. But compared to what you had at the time, I mean, that was light years different. So you have your first glass, and you're like, "Whoa, what did I just drink?" And and this is beer. And so then that was sort of the start. And I played a lot of Ultimate Frisbee at the time. So they sponsored a lot of our events. So uh, I got exposed to that Fort Gary Pale and that Fort Gary Dark. And those two beers, I will say I drank probably more than anybody should ever drink of a certain type of beer. Um, but that really opened my eyes. And then I moved to Alberta, which was way ahead of Manitoba at the time. And I got exposed to a lot of different craft beers. I know Big Rock now sort of has that. I'm, I'm a big brewery feel. But in the late 90s, early 2000s, they were still full blown. Everybody was like, whoa, what is this beer? And Trat was my was my beer then. And I, I had a lot of those beers again, playing open at Frisbee. And then sort of the third step, the step that really reeled me in with my first drive through the US, where we, we drove from Winnipeg to Boston. And we got a lot of craft beer on that trip. And it was, there was no going back after that. Always up to then I had sort of been a go back and forth, whatever was available. And then after that, I was like, yeah, I'm only drinking craft beer now. And, and that's it. I love it. So I, I could throw out a spotted cow reference. Cause that was the first beer, my first U.S. Uh, craft beer <laughs> me too it really was I was, I was yeah my wife then my girlfriend i go to wisconsin did i did i tell you this story i don't think so we we meet up with the, her friends after work and she worked in a radio station so they're hard drinking hard partying folks and we go to this place called john's tavern this is just this little dive in her town where she was living at the time and they're ordering rounds and rounds of beer. And I'm like, man, I can't, I can't afford rounds of beer. I'm a broke college student. And she <laughs> looks at me and at one point she's like, it'd be really nice of you to buy everybody a round of beer. And I'm like, that, uh, there's 20 people here. Like, uh, I don't have that much money for the entire trip, but let alone buying a round for people. So <laughs> she like bends my arm. She's like, don't worry, I'll, t I'll take care of you the rest of the trip. Just buy everybody a round, it'd be really nice. So I walk up to the bar top and the guy's like, what do you have? And I'm like, oh, around for everybody. And I slide over $150 across the bar top because that's just what I thought it would cost because that's what it would cost here. And he looks at me like I'm insane. And he, he pulls out a, one of the 20s from the pile of 20s and slides the rest back to me. He's like, here's your change. And the round of beers <laughs> comes out. And I'm like, wait a second. How, how much was that beer? <laughs> You know, and it was like a buck twenty five or something per beer. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and then I'm sitting there and I'm like, wait a second, how much is that one? And I point at the spotted cow tap and my wife's like, Oh, it's like twenty five cents more, so only like the really hardcore beer geeks get that stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, I'll I'll have one of those. <laughs> and then I was like, Oh my god, this tastes great. <laughs> Tell me all about New Glarus and that was yeah. that was like my first uh, Wisconsin craft beer story, and we've since then we've been to New Glarus Brewery and met the Carries, and it's just ah, oh, I just love it. Oh, that's awesome! And so many people share the same kind of stories, right? Of this is the beer that I had, and it's everybody has that same aha moment. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not the price though, because the the price is definitely not as cheap anymore down in the states as it as that. <laughs> I still feel like a rich king well, when I go. Yeah, still way bars. cheaper. Yeah, <laughs> it's not like here where you're paying eight bucks for a pint, right? <laughs> right? There's some sticker shock when they come up and visit. They bring a bunch of bratwurst and cheese and stuff because the you know they're good good German boys, and. Uh, we're drinking pints and I'm like, they're gobsmacked at the prices here. I can't believe it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. One of the things you mentioned was how difficult it's been in Manitoba. And from my limited experience, we're at literally one store in all of Manitoba. And the red <laughs> tape to sell to that one store 
is more than all the red tape of Saskatchewan and Alberta combined. It's insane. Like it's it's a labor of love. There's no profit to be made. It's just about our our good friends in in Winnipeg, our diehard rebels who moved from Regina to Winnipeg are like, please, 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 send some beer to us. I, what's your perspective on the Manitoba scene now? I mean, it's changed amazingly, and over the five years that we've been involved. Uh, the reason that we even exist is because they finally changed the laws that you could sell beer on site where you produce it. Up to then, you couldn't actually sell beer in the same place it was produced. So, I mean, that was that was huge, right? Yeah. <laughs> When's that law from? Um, but yeah, so they finally changed that. So that allowed tap rooms to exist. And really, that's what's allowed for the boom. I'll call it a boom because we went from two craft breweries to now we have 16 brick and mortar craft breweries. I mean, that's that's a pretty big difference in five years. And before that, yeah, it was just the red tape involved in anything was bad. It's still bad. I mean, it's still difficult, uh, but it's getting better. And it's actually, it's a lot better for us locals. We, we don't experience the same problem with listings here. I know you guys have to go through whole presentations and why do you want to carry the beer? Are you going to sell the beer? Are you going to promote the beer? What's going to happen? So we've so far been allowed to sort of skirt some of those rules where they'll, they'll list our beers as long as they're reasonable and a, a label is approved. Um, they won't just randomly take any beer, but um, as long as it's, you know, approved and good for sale, they will take it. So I do applaud them for that. Um, it's helped us a lot. Um, a lot of people are down on having a liquor mart, having a, you know, overall liquor board that controls everything. Um, we know within the next two years that it's going to be privatized. We don't know what model it's going to be, but it is going to be privatized. It's uh, before the government, the bill's been written. So they are working on that. I mean, we all know how government moves. So who knows when that will actually be. But our current government is a majority and they're not out of power until 2022. So we're assuming before before that election comes, there will be some sort of private uh, liquor in Manitoba, which will probably open it up for our friends outside of Manitoba to have a better shot at coming in and uh, being able to have their beers at, at multiple places. Although I must say you guys are at the Quality Inn, I will say it, because I, I, they're a huge supporter of the Manitoba craft beer scene, and they have been a supporter since day one, and they carry so many craft beers from all around. The, he. He goes out of his way, Chris, to source beers from all over, all over North America. He brings in from all over Canada, and uh, it, he is he he himself has helped build the craft beer scene in Manitoba as much as as anybody. He's hardcore. Like, yeah, very. All the beer geeks from Winnipeg, from Manitoba, they say you got to go to that guy's location if you want craft beer, if you want a knowledgeable staff that's the place to go yeah and and there are others now that are coming along and they're following his lead but i mean he had to set the example that that kind of store could succeed in manitoba we were still at that stage right can can a store that really focuses on craft beer i mean they sell everything else obviously but that really focuses on craft beer can they succeed and he's gone he's become the number one beer store in manitoba by doing that so it's a it's a pretty awesome awesome thing that he did and he has no end of support for all the local breweries we see uh how big the difference can be when a small retailer or just a single retailer has a champion there um i'll give you an example jeff pearson in estevan is a hardcore craft beer guy and you think What's Estevan thinking about craft beer? Probably not a lot. Probably just a standard light lager country, but they are into craft beer and driven largely in part by Jeff's passion and his excitement just for craft beer. It's just awesome. I'm sorry. I'm just saying the same words over and over again, but you, you see the impact he makes. He elevates the scene in just his small community and we see it on this like we plotted out on the chart numbers and stuff 
he kicks the crap out of some really big stars. He embarrasses them. He like pulls down their pants and ties their shoelaces together and then <laughs> gets off the starting blocks. And he, he's finished the race while they're still trying to f wondering what happened. You know, do you, do you guys see the same thing? Oh yeah, for sure. Like, um, we, we have a few supporters in the rural areas now. Um, so they've been slower to uptake sort of similar to you guys, I would assume, but there's a few champions out there in stores in places you're like, we're getting an order from here. What, what's going on? And then they're selling craft beer. Right. And that's really all you need is get the, to, is to get the beer to the people. And, and once it's there and once people try it, I mean, there's a certain amount of the population that's never going to stray from their, their light lager. And that's just what they're going to drink. And I mean, that's, that's fine. You still try to open up their eyes, but I mean, they're never going to become a craft beer evangelist. Uh, but you get it to a lot of other people and you get beer in places where you're like, yeah, I would swear that this would just be your typical light lager crowd and they're drinking, you know, our heaviest beer that we have and loving it. And we have it, had experience with Estevan. We've had orders from there and we're like, Estevan? Why are we getting an order from Estevan, Saskatchewan? First of all, where is it? <laughs> And why are they ordering our beer? But yeah, so we 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 know that he's he's pumping everybody's tires out there. He does a great job, and it really goes to show when your staff has a, a product knowledge and cares, how excited you can get consumers about it. It's not just about moving a volume of product; it's about really enriching somebody's food and drink experience by recommending the right beer to them yeah exactly and and just when you know people's what they like and be able to nudge them in one direction person's not going to go from a light lager to you know a triple ipa but just be able to nudge them in the right direction often is all it takes now that you're a few years into the game as a bigger brewer you've got to have like a favorite torque story like that one standout moment you just share over pints Oh God, we, we, we have so many moments, but the one that I, I often share shows sort of my naiv naivety at the beginning and just our willingness to do whatever it takes. And this, this sort of was more than a just a moment. So our first anniversary was coming and we'd all put our heads together and we're like, okay, you know, six months before we're like, okay, we're going to brew a Saison, we're going to barrel age it, and then we're going to bottle it. So we have a canning line, we don't have a bottling line. So we're like, okay, yeah, beer's brewed, beer's turned out awesome, barrels is great, get it into a bright tank. We're like, huh, how are we going to bottle it now? <laughs> so a bunch of us get together with Blickman beer guns, leading off the tank, and we sit there and bottle for about 24 hours. 3,000 liters of liquid, 500 mils at a time, takes a while. And we just all sat there. We took turns. Yeah, there was five or six of us just sitting there, taking turns, filling bottles. People actually fell asleep well in the middle of bottling beer. Um, and then we, we just, you know, everybody got it done. There was no complaints. Everybody was having fun. Like, it's one of those moments where it, it's a really tough thing to do at the time, but you're also having fun. And it just showed what, what beer could be, what craft beer could be. And what, what it meant to be torque, we're sort of brute force and ignorance. <laughs> we can get this beer out. Um, and then we decided to wax all the bottles. <laughs> so there's another like 24 hours of fun playing with hot wax on all these bottles, but we got it out. It was bottle conditioned, it was great. And people loved it. And we just, that, that moment brought together sort of our initial team. We still have our number one and number two employees and they they talk about the, that moment all the time. They're just, do you remember when we did this? And it's like, yep, I remember. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's just one of those moments that sort of brought everybody together and also just said what Torque was. Like we're, we're in it for the beer and we're gonna do whatever it takes to get that the best product that we can out to people and it, it's every time we we think about a bottle release now we're like remember that time 
there's got to be an easier way. <laughs> there's got to be an easier way. <laughs> so we've had, we, I mean, of course, everybody has those stories of the first days and everything else. And I mean, we all went through that. But I, I think just as a, as Torque, that's one of the best moments that we had. We, you know, we did a lot of the construction and a lot of that kind of stuff. So there's so many good stories. And if you follow Torque's social media recently, we've been, of course, you know, remembering since we're coming up on five years. So there's been a lot of posts out there of, you know, me doing stupid things like epoxying floors and dancing around and all that kind of stuff, which was all, I mean, the whole process was amazing. And I, I, if you're really doing something you love, you're not working, right? We just, we are having fun. You may not want to ask our wives about the not working part, but, uh, we we all had fun and it was such a family experience getting Torque up off the ground. <laughs> you spend all your time at the brewery. <laughs> when are you gonna spend time with me? <laughs> yeah, well, my wife, I must say, learned early on. And so we had the worst I mean, this is the second best torque story and it's just related to me. So hey honey, I'm gonna start a brewery. Okay. Um okay. We're, we're almost done construction. Oh yeah, I forgot, you're nine and a half months pregnant. Oh yeah, we just filled our tanks and you've gone into labor. Huh. A week later, we move from one house to another. So my wife is more than a saint. We made it through that. And then starting at about my daughter's two, two months of age, she was at the brewery with her on her back, packaging, uh, putting cans in the boxes, cleaning up in the tap room. So it, it's been a very much a family effort. And I have an older son that uh, he's 11 and he's he spent a lot of time at the brewery and he knows more about brewing than a lot of people will ever know. And uh, it's just fun. It's just fun to have, to have that ability to have your kids around when you're doing work and just to see what it's like. I, I, I say it to anybody now. I mean, I'm, I'm not from a entrepreneurial family, everybody that I know had, you know, regular jobs. Um, but for your family to be able to be involved and see what you're doing and just learn some of those experiences at a young age is, is to me, um, just something that you can't replace. And they'll, they'll remember those mem memories as much as I will from, from those early days. They, Ethan still talks to me all the time. He's like, remember that time when I was cleaning the mash tun? I'm like, yeah, you probably shouldn't tell anybody that until you're a little bit older. <laughs> well, hopefully remuneration was uh, fair. Well, you know, it wasn't child labor. <laughs> <laughs> I know my little guys get excited whenever they see the rebellion trucks rolling by. They're like, dad, that's your work. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. buddy. Yeah. Oh man, that's that's a that's a great story, man. Thanks for sharing that one. If somebody's coming from Saskatchewan or Alberta, maybe they're a Winnipeg listener and they're they're coming into Torque, what beer do they absolutely need to check out next? Okay, so this is always the question and and to anybody into craft beer, it's always what's new. That that's, you know, there, there's no longer the loyal drinker that's drinking the same beer all the time. It's always what's new. And that's great. I mean, I'm the same way. I've been that way for a while. There's certain beers that I always go back to. So I'm going to split it into a couple sections just because I can do that. <laughs> so of our core beers, um, if, if, you, if you do really appreciate a good lager or what the hell is, we've talked about it a little bit. I go back to that beer all the time and I just, I just always appreciate what it is, how flavorful it is, and the, you know the fact that there's no flaws to it. Like it's just a good, solid Hellas um, with with flavor, and I enjoy drinking it. I mean, I'm biased, of course. I came up with the recipe at some point ages ago, um, but it's just one of those beers that, and I've noticed that lately. Like a lot of craft beer fans are. They enjoy all the crazy stuff, but they want to. They want something they can go to that they're like, yeah, this this is just a good solid, as you guys would call it, beer. And I really like the Hellas. <laughs> I, I for that reason, it just it's sort of my go to in the fridge. It's sitting there if if I just want to have a beer after mowing the lawn or whatever. 
Um, and then of course we get to sort of the newer beers. So we've been playing with a, a sour series. We started it in January. So we're doing it quarterly. We release a new uh, sour beer. They're all kettle sours to this point, just because we have some some laid away that'll be ready in a, you know a few years. But to start out with, we're just doing them as kettle sours. So uh, our first one was Big Bang. It was you know appropriately named. Uh, but our recent one, the most recent one, just came out beginning of August, and it's called Event Horizon, and it's a peach hibiscus goza, and it's got great peach flavor, which I find is so hard to get into a beer. So I I totally applaud our head brewer Perry who does almost all of our our new beers and he is just a master and he he came up with a good one here where you can taste the peach you get that hibiscus the little bit of tea like flavor without the sort of tanniny uh, uh, taste that can come off of it and then it's just it's nice and sour a, a lot of people say our kettle sours are a little more sour than they're used to we like to be on the sour end um, but yeah, it's just, I find that kettle sour in the summer just quenches your thirst so good. It's, it's like that old school kid lemonade, right? That little bit of acid just, just quenches your thirst so well. So there's that one sort of the newest for the craft beer folk that, that will probably really like it. Uh, and then we also have our, uh, pineapple Jeff. So it's a pineapple Hefeweizen loaded with pineapple and you get the banana and clove also. Um, that one just, we released it last week. We're almost out. But if you, I mean, we're almost out at the brewery. It's obviously out and about in Winnipeg. I would suggest if you can get a hold of that one, give it a nice try. It's perfect for summer, especially a summer like we're having. I'm sure you guys are having the same summer we are, where it's thir above 30 every day and no rain. So just having that nice thirst quenching beers, that's what we're, we're having right now. And then obviously anybody, if you are, in Winnipeg or gonna be in Winnipeg, August uh, 17th to 21st is our fifth anniversary week. And we're gonna be having events going on every day. Uh, we have a golf tournament on the 17th. We have a, a, a local market is gonna be at, in the tap room parking lot on the Wednesday. And then we have a, a chef coming in to do food pairing on the uh, 19th. And then 20th, we're going to have some bands playing in the parking lot. And then 21st is the actual day where we, we're going to be just crazy. And every day we're releasing a beer. So it's our fifth anniversary. We're having five years of torque and there's five new releases. So it's going to be, going to be interesting and uh, a crazy week here. Uh, but yeah, if, if you're, if you're into sort of the rarer beers, we're, we're going to have five small batch releases that will probably sell out fairly quickly so uh if you if you want them you're gonna have to either be here to get them or you're gonna have to know somebody that you can trade with <laughs> you know i love that diesel fitter it was my favorite from your entire lineup i i'm biased towards dark beers though um i highly recommend that to anyone who can get their hands on it oh yeah and, and we have it we have very limited quantities of it right now uh and it's going to disappear for a while but it'll come back <laughs> Adam, I just want to thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. And it's hopefully I'll be back in Saskatchewan soon and we'll uh, be able to, you know, talk football and beer. We'll get you one of those experience for Janice shirts to take home. Oh, I need one of those for sure. You guys, like Rebellion itself has pushed the scene so far in Regina and just seeing what you guys do is, is uh, enlightening and also allows us to start doing some of the stuff that we want to do just saying you know what rebellion can do it in regina we can do it in winnipeg <laughs> oh that's that's very humbling thanks man <laughs>
Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Untapped so you don't miss out on the latest in SAS craft beer news. Thank you for joining the Rebellion. Thank you.